Our academic and applied esports program provides our competitive gamers a national stage to compete with other Division I universities. Our academic objective allows us to use esports to foster innovative interdisciplinary connections. Esports right now is an ever-expanding career field and having the opportunity to showcase its many facets through education is really inspiring. It begins with our mission and values, a culture of innovation and collaboration, achieving a global perspective beyond the classroom, turning education and theory into practice, developing lifelong interests and connections, and striving to make a difference in our communities. Marist College. Welcome one, welcome all to another week of EGFC. My name is Keela Miles, joined as always on the second stream by Soy. And today we are opening up with some real heavy hitters. A real swingy match that is going to unfold before us. It is William and Mary versus Maris. Two not even rising stars, they are long-standing titans ready to slug it out before us, Soy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. William and Mary coming in here at three and one and one of the favorites in their division to be in that championship contention. And Marist undefeated so far on the year, barely allowing any points through the first three weeks of action. They are going to be one of the favorites in that MAC conference as well. So two titans of the EGF going head to head here. Yeah, and speaking of head to head, we're starting out as head to head as we can get with the captains coming in first. Dizzy from William and Mary opting for Sora. Uh, well, I'm glad Zucchini is taking it fully seriously and not going a secondary of their own because, well, I, I think the story is going to be deadly. Yeah, absolutely. And Dizzy normally picking Bayonetta, opting for Sora this time around is an interesting swap, considering that we talk about how Zucchini, how good he is, but he normally plays these kind of big, heavier characters. So I'm interested to see what his Ridley can do here against Sora. And you can see Sora's main tool right there. The Nair leading into everything. Nair into another Nair, Nair into a forward air, Nair into an up smash. It's just imagination, and isn't that what Disney's all about? As they're able to get the freeze into the up smash. But Zucchini's still living for now, but really struggling to land on the stage. Oh, there you're caught by the lightning. That was a really good catch. I'm actually surprised that, the, you know, I thought Ridley had a little bit of armor on that upbeat, but not enough to get through that thunder. So great job by Dizzy, kind of recognizing which spell he had available and landing that edge guard. Using that forward tail, there's a little bit of a get off me tool, but now you're just getting slapped around by the three hit combo. I mean, there's gonna be a lot of count count in here. One, two, three. Three lightning bolts, three spells, and three hits on that neutral aerial. One, two, but I'm not going for the third to try and set up into a stronger move. Ooh. Zucchini got behind him in time to get that forward smash off. Not sure Dizzy was ready for that air dodge, but now an opening for Zucchini to try and get this game back to even. Catches the jump. This could be big. And I love that. Not over committing at all. Able to get the counter hit out off of the lightning, but caught out by the side B when you try and do the fireballs. Throw a fireball. A little bit better, though. Not able to convert into that forward smash, though. Correct the eye from Zucchini on those nares. Aware of the setups that they're going for and knowing that Dizzy's fishing hard for a kill right now. And it's allowed Zucchini to kind of get his way back into this match, too. 137, but he's got 91 on the Sora. And Sora's one of the lighter characters in the cast. And Ruby's got plenty of kill power, but he's got to play so careful. This should be the stock. Mm. Yes, it is. The up air will take it. Perfect timing right there from Dizzy to finish them off. Side B's gonna send them off stage though. Sora's not gonna have much trouble recovering in the slightest. Gonna avoid the two frame right there and the hard ledged call out with the down smash. Zucchini may be getting a little bit cheeky there, but sometimes you gotta when you're behind in a stock like that and your opponent, especially in a crew battle format where your opponent is playing to preserve as many stocks as possible, they not, might not be ready for those crazy options. 
That's three side keys in a row from Zucchini that have landed, but just haven't found a way to take that stock quite yet. That up B, though, will do the trick. So Zucchini getting busy down to his last stock, but now here's the tr here's the problem. He's at 55, and Sora on a whole fresh stock here, landing that counter means he's got all the pressure in the world. And forcing an air dodge with the lightning as well. Approaching from the air when Thunderag Thundaga is online. It's rough, but tech chase situation doesn't convert into the nair, but you've still got Dizzy swinging around, fishing for a hit. Down tilt again. Zucchini looking a lot cleaner on these punishes. Have Dizzy at ledge and... Oh man, I thought they pineapple themselves, but they have very good awareness already on how to recover on this character. Very clean and Dizzy going for the edge guard, going deep. They're both going to be able to make it back there. Great avoidance by Zucchini. No side B's doing so much work. It's going to take the stock. Zucchini clutching out game one. I am shocked that killed. That was impressive, though, from Zucchini clawing the way back into that one. And I feel like it really was the defensive options that they brought to the table. I mean, you saw in the beginning it was kind of a one-sided story with continuously again and again and again just being called out by the disjoints by anti-airing with thunder uh thundaga but dizzy didn't get much mileage off of that towards the end as zucchini was even though they weren't really getting hard punishes on the options they were forcing dizzy to improvise to try and find something and off ledge it looked like zucchini was just a little more comfortable even though sora has more tools yeah, absolutely. And I think the story, like you said, was the defensive play. Think of how many times Zucchini was able to air dodge away or out of Dizzy's next hits. And Dizzy's a player who likes these combo style characters. And the fact that he can't find those extra hits, it's really damaging to his play style. Yeah, trying to convert into more there, but Sora can't really juggle or follow up on the juggle like many others. It's saw that slow jump wasn't gonna be enough the counter will be though getting the hitbox on that up the turning it against them yeah. zucchini numerous times has gone for those fireballs off stage and that's actually a really good option because it kind of forces dizzy to space out and make sure he's got the proper way to to snap the ledge very true is perfect spacing again over the top of that thundaga Able to survive for now, dragging down with the forward air though. Interesting. As they're trying to space back airs on ledge, catch them at such a high percent, but that burst option to the up B, that's the second time it's caught Dizzy. Very dangerous. Ooh, Dizzy not quite snapping the ledge there, but he will get away with it for now. And at 132, anything Dizzy gets here could be massive. Ooh. And you can see Dizzy a lot more risk for the space that Dizzy has until they throw out that counter. The counter's good, but it's not that good. And the down air doesn't reach all the way to the floor. So, Zucchini's there to scoop him up, pick him up from their uh, long trip down. A big stock for Zucchini to take as he's almost already at kill percentage. You saw how dangerous that counter could be close to ledge. Look for Dizzy to hold that option again in his pocket until later really good di up on a lot of these forward tilts and down tilts right here before zucchini was getting a lot of tech chases off of it but now dizzy is not letting that happen always having the correct di to avoid that scenario where zucchini has just been reacting oh perfect I, mash right there too that was huge i i really like that option and, you know zucchini numerous times has gone for that side beat from ledge and it's worked a lot but dizzy is starting to you know with that mash you see he's starting to catch on to it Sora's zoning is interesting. Like, I haven't really caught on to the rhythm yet as much as some other players, but the way it is like a quick time event constantly changing up, it can really trip you up, especially as then you have to also factor in your opponent's movement as you're throwing them out. I like how Dizzy has been using them, though. I feel like it is a little bit basic, and Zucchini is getting through the wall. It's not as versatile as someone like pac-man's zoning options but still definitely a lot of potential especially so many of them lead to kills but 214 percent you're gonna need to find some of those kills from the special 
Able to clean up the stock right there and tie things back up. Dizzy lost his stock in kind of an awkward fashion. I wonder if it was a, a misinput. He up beat very high to the, into the blast zone and just put himself in special fall. But it's an opening that Zucchini will take. And speaking of openings, Dizzy getting so much off this edge guard. Yeah. Able to instantly retake the lead and preventing any sort of ledge trapping by throwing out the Fandaga overneath the ledge. Now. Knocked off the stage thanks to the fireballs. Perfect spacing right now to really hit every option that Dizzy could want to go for. But that really, really big call out is going to cost you. Still at a jump. They're able to get back to stage. Fine, but trying to dash through them. They're going to survive for now thanks to the air dodge in. Side B, though, doesn't quite get you the distance. I'm not sure if they had a jump. Yeah, uh, unfortunate way for Zucchini to lose his stock there. But either way, William and Mary will take it. Push. Uh, this set to game number three and I also wonder too if that side B if it just had kind of too much end lag on it for him to even have his jump available it's possible I mean we've seen definitely crazier things but I don't know that that doesn't seem like a zucchini option when you have a mastery over a mid tier like that you don't mess up like that or if you do you're laughing about it so either way, I feel like Zucchini's doing all right, especially since you kept it that close throughout the entire thing. What it could have also been, from what I've, how I've spoken to Zucchini, a very Zucchini move, does Ridley's side B kill your opponent first if you hit it off stage? That could have been what Zucchini was going for. I mean, Dizzy was all the way down there. Two, one. I, yeah, now, now that I think about it, I, I honestly forget if it kills you first or not. Uh, but either way, game, game number three here, running it back to Smashville, and Dizzy once again off to a little bit of an early lead, but I feel like the pace of this match is kind of dictated by Zucchini's side Bs, because that's how Zucchini is getting a lot of mileage, you know, finding his way out of the corner, kind of breaking through neutral by doing so. And it's all also, like we said, a kill move. So really, the use of that move is something I'm looking for here in game number three. Name a better trio than Fireball, Shield Pressures, and Smash Ultimate. I mean, it feels like every character with a Fireball is able to just attack your shield for free. And that is a mix-up that Zucchini has also been doing the entire time. Fireballs on a shield, and then when you block it, you're too much shield stun to really do anything. Look at that! You get caught by the fireball, it's a perfect setup. The little end lag on that is benefiting Zucchini so much. It's the Ridley classic, but Zucchini's using it really well as Dizzy's not approaching as much, but the jump is still called out by the Thundaga. The Thundaga able to take the stock. That was... Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that was planned or not, but either way, Zucchini able to answer right back. That up smash just stalling out long enough around that counter, but Dizzy answering with a combo of his own. Yeah, the charge, forward smash, are you kidding me, Dizzy? As Zucchini is struggling to get back on the stage, the floor is lava, but luckily, they got plenty of jumps and they're pretty much a dragon, so I'm pretty sure they're fine with fire as they demonstrate that now, keeping Dizzy on ledge, but going to the platform actually gives them an opportunity to get off, and now it's uh, Dizzy doing the ledge trapping until that's not a safe area. <laughs> Dizzy has, or sorry, Zucchini has not really been able to land any of these edge guards, and it's been so difficult for him to. You see Dizzy, or, or sorry, Zucchini is still starting to catch on to the aerial movement of Dizzy, but it's just been so difficult Dizzy's made himself so hard to track down. And you keep calling out these side beats, and Zucchini is happy to deliver, and you just edge guarded Sora. Congratulations, Zucchini, you've done what I can. As going really deep with the Nair before Sora commits any big options was huge. Now you got the stock lead to play with until you get caught by the forward smash, but you've got them out of that early percent. Down tilt's gonna set up in some serious damage, or the up tilt, up tilt, up air right there. 58% on Dizzy. Ooh, and that forward smash is a lot of damage too. So now Dizzy has to play very carefully because like we said, Zucchini's got a lot of ways he can kill this character, but it's a matter of how he gets in and the movement from Zucchini right now, very defensive. And you called out how many ways Ridley has to kill. I feel like that's almost more of a detriment because look at this, Zucchini was going for smash attack, smash attack, side B, side B. 
I was almost betting for a side B from ledge right there. <laughs> he wants this kill really bad. I mean, obviously, with the landing back here in the wrong direction, that's not going to kill. He has busy on ledge. What do you got to do with it? Run right into the breeze, but not really a cute setup right there. Side B is going to kick. Yes, it will. Zucchini in the opening captain match is able to win it out for Marist College and give them an early lead over William and Mary. And that's huge, too, because we talk about how good these teams are. The captains are kind of, I don't want to say the anchors of this roster, but there's someone that the rest of this team really looks up to. And so for Zucchini, for Maris to take this set and keep his record clean, he is four, he was 4-0 and on the season entering this set. And now he makes himself 5-0 and and gives Maris this three-point lead. That is a huge boost in momentum for the Red Foxes. 100%. And... Doing it against a new character, I mean, if I'm in the EGF right now, playing online, I think Sora is my most practiced against character. I mean, anytime a new DLC character comes out, you gotta be like, okay, someone on the enemy team, probably their best player, because the best player always wants to be like, hey, I'm secondarying this person now. So you've got to be ready for every single thing that character throws at you. And I feel like Zucchini really was. A lot of crucial DI uh, to get out of uh, the noops. Nair loops as our producer from House of 3000 was shouting out. That, like, DIing up to avoid any true follow-ups. And obviously there are some 50-50s, some mix-ups right there. If Zucchini always does that, then Dizzy could have called them out. But Zucchini was tricky with their defense, and even though they did struggle to get off ledge at times, they were still able to pressure from distance with fireballs, close said distance, and get huge punishes. I also really got to commend, you know, Zucchini's defensive play for things uh, like spacing. How many times did Dizzy use side B on stage, which is almost, it almost acts like a homing attack at times, and... Zucchini was able to space around it and punish numerous times. That's how he got so many side Bs off. And eventually that move, like you saw, will just kill. So fantastic stuff to Zucchini once again. And I love also another thing Zucchini was doing, the up B in neutral. I think it's called the wiggle snarf. I don't know why it's called that. I hope it's not something bad, but um, that is the classic right there. That's a classic for me, very close to my heart, the up B on stage offensively. It's like when Falcons randomly throw out a Falcon kick just to get that kill, because it's the least optimal burst option you have. It's so much startup, you can react to it from it a from a mile away, but sometimes you don't. And if you're not expecting to have to react to something like that, then sometimes you're going to miss it. And that is something Zucchini was really banking on, especially online, and it ended up getting them quite a few stocks. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, between that and even the use of it off stage too, I believe that's how he was able to secure one of the stocks. It, like we've talked about before, being able to secure stocks in this matchup, in this type of format, is of the utmost importance. And the fact that you know, Zucchini was able to land more edge guards. When Sora has so much presence off stage, it was Zucchini who was able to go out there, land the upbeat, land the nares, things of that nature. That was, I think, a, another huge point of momentum for Marist. Yeah, and now Marist playing this lead, I mean, you know the history a little bit better than me. Like, what would a win here mean? Because these are two titans, but where? how historically have they done against each other? Like, I know, isn't Maris projected to win a little bit here? Well, I mean, between these, these two, I don't believe have ever played each other. And typically the MAC conference, at least for Super Smash Bros, tended to struggle out of conference. So William and Mary, I think, walk in here, even though they are behind in record, three and one versus four and oh, William Mary, I think, kind of walk in here as the favorite, especially with how great their performance was last year. But like we said, Maris historically here in the EGF has been one of these teams that's just out of reach of a, of a championship. They were top four in season one. They were top four in MAC again in in the last season. And this year at 4-0, they're right up there with Sienna tied with them. So if they can keep pace with the defending MAC champions, it's a huge sign for them. Yeah, and William Mary. They definitely have the tools to do it. The issue is, that scares me, is 
not only do Maris have the tools to put up a good defense, they got tools on tools on tools on tools. I mean, they've got tool specialists like Chimmy the Steve player who, honestly, I love Chimmy. Like, one of the players I am unabashedly unafraid to say that I am a fan of. The fact that Chimmy is constantly rushing in there and they've got the punish game to back up such aggressive play, it's, it's wonderful to see. You've got to appreciate it. As we're just trying to see who is coming up next right about now. Let's see, let's see. Ooh. Analyzing it looks, data. It looks like... Sorry, I, I was going to jump in. I, I just pulled up the, the schedule. It looks like the, the players have been locked in. It's going to be Coldface versus Luko. Yeah, the Sorty Ditto right here, and Luka is sticking it out with this Sephiroth. A very fearsome Cloud player in the past, but they're a Final Fantasy loyalist, so Luko going to be on this Sephiroth, and we did see some very clean play. I believe Luko decimated a Pikachu player at one point. I can't quite remember who, but Lucina is a bit of a different matchup. Has the speed of a Rushdown character, but the disjoint of a Sorty, and I mean, up there with Palu is probably one of the most consistent characters in the entire game. So if Coldface is able to play that consistency game and just get bread and butters, get consistent kills at reasonable percents, I have a good feeling for Maris, but Coldface at the moment is at the receiving end of a lot of these specials. Getting around that ledge, trapping the down air on shield, it's gonna lead to a chicken situation. They get the grab. <laughs> the Coldface isn't able to convert on the most more. Ooh, good counter there by Coldface, knowing Luko really wants this kill. Coldface is doing a better job now at a higher percent of playing defensive. Yeah, as, ooh, the up air is going to finish them off. Luko does get the stock lead right now. It'll be huge for Maris right now. Or, well, I mean, Mary, rather. <laughs> ooh, quick combo there from Luko, and wanted the counter, not able to find it, but that up! Catching Luko on his recovery. Great spacing there by Coldface. Yes. Ooh. Board tilt baiting an option in into the immediate down smash. So even if they tried to the shield, they would have been in a world of pain. But look at that beautiful spacing with the disjoint. Coldface actually goes right over the counter. Very nice. I, I mean, Coldface is slowly finding their way in over these defensive options, but the early lead that Luko built is going to benefit them a lot. Absolutely. As Sephiroth, we know, has a lot of kill power in his kit as well, and just covers so much space, too. Coldface really struggling here. Two rolls back, but he does manage to get Luko off stage, and the forward smash! Cleaning up the stock, Coldface has turned this match around. What doing with a cameo appearance right there, a little Easter egg that's not going to be enough. As it's an even stock after that forward tilt, one to one. Completely beating out that side B, but the flanking lag is going to give Luko a little bit of an opening. But they don't convert it into too much. They're just playing the range game, the combo game. They know their zoning is a little bit better than their Sivas. Running a combo with the Shadow Flare. The upbeat ledge, though, is going to open you up to a punish. But going for the hard read on the forward smash is going to make you drop that combo. Side B on shield, not going to be safe. And now we got the ledge trapping. The Giga Flare. And it actually catches Coldface with the outside hitbox. That was a huge opening. And oh, that's a greedy forward smash. And Luko is there to punish. So Luko able to take game one. That right there. In all senses of the word, saying, hey, my spacing's better than yours. <laughs> As that is, I mean, maybe fishing a little bit. I mean, as you saw for a little bit there, Coldface was Codface, and that's pretty, M I mean, pretty representative of how they were going about finding the stock towards the end. I mean, count the forward smashes, a one, a two, a three. I mean, they wanted to crack that lollipop so much, but <sighs> Luca wasn't giving it to him. They were not falling for the trap. It's like, I mean, my sword's bigger. All I need to do is just space correctly, and I get a huge punish on that charging forward smash. It's it's Sisyphusian right there. You want to go in for that so badly, but it it's too much of a chance to take online. It's an overextension. 
Offline may be a different story, but online, you never know how your drift is going to be affected. So I appreciate Lugo not overextending, waiting, staying chill, getting the kill, and getting some more points on the board for William and Mary. Yeah, really playing to the, the strength of the matchup there was Luco. And, and you have to wonder, too, because they were kind of, you know, hunting towards the end of that match. These are two players that are very new to the EGF. They started this year, I believe. And so there's a lot of pressure on them to, you know, keep up with the depth of this roster for both sides. Both players are, are you know, very new. And they've had a lot of early success. So... I feel like that might play a little bit of a factor here in that mental game as we get ready for game number two. Yeah, and it is interesting that William and Mary and Marist are kind of doing head-to-heads. Like, I the optimal strategy, if I'm being honest, I, is to kind of farm. I mean, send in the, your best player against their worst to get an eight stock if you can. But these teams don't appear to be doing this as, hmm. Coldface going over to the Captain Falcon. I mean, I remember Zucchini called out Coldface on having like five different characters. So I'm not surprised to see the Falcon whatsoever. And I'm curious how the speed will benefit them in closing the distance against this uh, very, very speedy zoner. I mean, relatively to other zoners anyway, besides one. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 get, uh, I get what you're going for. Coldface too. The speed seems to be working in his favor as he's got a little bit of an early lead, but he is going to be off stage, and I think this is where the matchup's really going to be won and lost. Can Coldface find a way out of the corner here? There is Luko overextending allows Coldface to get back, but only a jab follow up. I mean, ooh, catching them, not air dodging right there, and saying, "All right, all right, you think I'm going for another up air psych?" I was playing safe before, but not this time. You know I'm going in. Huge stock by Coldface, and now ooh, he wanted another defensive option there. Coldface didn't throw out an aerial, so he'll keep that in note. And so look at these up airs doing so much work. 60% already on Luko's second stock. That wasn't true, though. You saw the startup of Shadow Flare three times in those up air strings. And even though you get that up smash, Luko was greedy right there. Doing the exact opposite of what I praised them for before of not overextending. They wanted the reversals so bad that they ate 60% for it. Ooh, possibly an opening off the stop, but not going to get a follow-up. And one thing that I've noticed here in game number two is that Coldface's spacing around those counters here has not been as, as tight as it was with Lucina. And so look for that as this match goes on. Is the counter able to take the stock for Luko? When you don't have a disjoint, it's all or nothing, especially for Falcon, who can't really decommit once you decide to go in. As being near that ledge, oh, there's no hope for you getting caught by V up B. Jab on platform, you can set up a tech chase as Luko, after being at a deficit, has clawed their way back into this. But there is what I affectionately call the mystery hitbox of Captain Falcon Stomp, sending you straight out um, as they are able to get some nice damage, but the DI out saves you from the down throw in air for following it up. They went for it all right there, but that time Luko did not get through, the air dodging out. Mm. I think what happened there, Soy, I think what happened is Coldface was DIing in to try and tech on the platform, and they called them hard out on that. They're like, oh, you want that platform? You want that safety? No. No, you're going to get back aired before you even touch the ground. Yeah, no, that was, I, I mean, you couldn't see it, but I, I was shocked. I, I was, you know, Coldface had done such a good job of kind of surviving aside from, you know, the one or two over extensions that match. But like you saw, just well spaced by Luco to get that turnaround back and, uh, and seal away that set too. I mean, that is a, this is a nail biter through the first two sets. And that was a huge, the fact that Coldface got zero points on the board. That's one of his first losses here in the EGF. And that's one of Luko's first major victories. So big momentum swing now in favor of the William and Mary tribe. Yeah, given Mary's zilch right there. And I mean, they kept it close for a time. And I really thought... I, I really thought for a little bit the combo game that they were bringing to the table was enough but as i mentioned i don't think the combo game was as there as it initially appeared i think that was luco trying to get reversals 
the Shadow Flare, the Nair, out of disadvantage, try and turn things around, get some percent of their own. Towards the end of that game, what I think we saw was Luko going, all right, I'll play your game, and they just air dodge. And, well, they were not ready to really capitalize on those air dodges. They didn't try and call out an early air dodge once by landing and just catching them, extending the combo. Instead, they just kept going for the same things that were not working anymore. Even though they worked in the beginning of the game, the adaptation was that fast. Yeah, and that's a mark of a good player, the ability to adapt not only mid-set, but mid-match. And so that's, like you said, I think really what gave Luko the edge there in game number two and allowed him to, to clean up that set. Yeah. As I called him out before, he's on his way. My main man Shimmy is coming to the stage, but it ain't going to be easy for them because they are up against North, who I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, is that fearsome Wii Fit trainer from Will, uh, yeah, William & Mary. Yeah, absolutely. North, one of the new faces to this William & Mary roster, and he has made a name for himself on this Wii Fit trainer taking names and getting some points on the board. So Jimmy absolutely, I think, is going to have so, uh, you know his work cut out for him this set. Yeah, I mean, I think in the ditto, and dittos are not always uh, representative of pure skill with a character, but in the ditto, they even beat Rip Van Winkle, who's one of the other really prominent Wii Fit trainers in the EGF. So some nice stuff right there. And I feel like Steve... <laughs> I can't comment too much on how Steve, he, as a whole character, does against Wii Fit Trainer, but I do know that Chimmy Steve wants to approach. I keep calling it out because it's the name of the game. You will see, if you are unfamiliar with this uh, player, you will see Chimmy holds forward. I mean, full on sprint jumping towards their opponent. It's, <laughs> it's honestly a little scary because if they do hit you, they do have the skill to really punish you the issue is do they get that hit if you're playing the range game and i feel like we fit trainer has the tools to make sure that you're never getting in touch <laughs> yeah no i absolutely like we said when jimmy finds his one opening he is he's got everything down the bread and butter all of it like we saw the first two weeks i think we saw him play he was landing that 70 percent combos on players that we thought okay maybe maybe they'll get out of this but no he just his extensions were perfect and against North, it's not going to be as easy. I mean, we've seen numerous times Wii Fit loves to play around the ledge, uses projectiles to his advantage. So I think the question really comes down to how good is Chimmy's uh, stay, uh, excuse me, how good is his play off stage? Can he find a way to contest with these projectiles? That is very true. And we'll see how, how uh, North is going to fare against this rushdown Steve. Is it getting right into it? Pokemon Stadium 2, getting some resources for the time being, and then immediate grab. Okay, nice call out from Jimmy right there as they're just trying to keep the ledge trap going. Some tricky movement on ledge off of these blocks as they're able to use the minecart to super armor through that volleyball. Setting up the wall there, allowing himself to get some extra resources, get a little bit more power on the board. Quick follow-up there off of that forward, Aaron. Kind of Jimmy, back and forth through this stock. Setting up a wall and mining for resources? It's uncharacteristic. But I think that shows the amount of respect that they have for North. The fact that they're like, okay, okay, fine. Play to the strengths of my character. If you make me, as North is doing a really good job safely pressuring their shield. The landing back airs, the soccer balls, it's making it so hard to keep a full health shield. And when you don't have that full health, the shield poke is there. But that was just Shimmy dropping the shield. They were looking for a follow-up. Not able to time the two frame though, and the charged F smash is gonna punish hard. Unable to get that edge guard either is Shimmy. And so now a huge lead here for North on this stock. He is near kill percent, but again, North doing a great job of kind of controlling the pace of this matchup so far. Yeah, and almost, I mean, at minimum 50% deep breathing uptime, they are always having that buff, and I feel like that is making Chimmy give them a lot more respect, but block it right into a homemade stage hazard right there. Chimmy, 
Trying to space these back airs, trying to slowly close out the space that North is working with. That's not going to be enough to finish the stock, though. We talked about the offstage game, but standing too close to the ledge is going to be your doom. Is Shim able to get the edge guard? No, just dropping the anvil right on ledge. Down smash is going to punish, though. Oh, Chimmy! Like, these are literally from downtown. And I feel like the focus on getting resources right here is really going to Chimmy's detriment is they're going for these quote safe options and getting caught by the soccer balls from forever away yeah it's really difficult that forward tilt gonna clean up the stock and now Chimmy down a full stock here and the other thing too that we saw about North the first time we saw him he was able to survive these very high percents you even saw it here on stock number one living to 160 means that Chimmy really has to find these combos and it's just so difficult for him to do so yeah, able to convert it into some 50% and you get the grab into the up there but not able to continue it into any more didn't get any uh, instant lands right there and on last stock with them off stage you've got to get the opportunity to get the diamond tools online the comeback factor is here is it enough though? I feel like North is both a sizable lead and their neutral has been on point as they knock the TNT away from the ledge a little bit. We think the trainer is happy to stall on the ledge for as long as you please, but not spacing that flint and steel correctly is going to give North an opportunity to get back on stage, back to the other ledge. What can you do with it? He's just gonna get grabbed. Deep breathing being on deck too. You gotta feel a little bit scared if you're Chimmy. That down air not gonna land, and now from downtown he will be able to make it back to stage, but north with all the presence in the world. And not going for any of these downers off stage. Is that too far? Oh! Chimmy with a perfect glide mechanic right there, able to get back to stage as they just. Well, they're speed bridging over. I mean, there's no other word for it. But at 152%, these neutral interactions have mostly been Chimmy being hit by soccer balls. It's just ship damage. And well, half a heart left, and they're going to be knocked out right now. North with two stocks for Willem and Mary. Let's do some jack Starting to build more of a lead now going into the latter half. I mean, we're at the exact half point right now, Soy. And Willem and Mary is looking strong. Yeah, absolutely. And... For North, I think that was a fantastic showing for him, really showing not only kind of his uh, knowledge of what he needs to do, but his proficiency in the character, right? I mean, so many times, not only was he, you know, landing soccer ball after soccer ball, but the ability to survive. He was up at those high percents for so long and Chimmy just could not find a strong hit. And those strengths that we talked about for Chimmy, the being able to string together hits it wasn't here this game. He was only ever to get, you know, two, three hits maximum on those combos, and that was it. Eh, yeah, let's give him a little credit. I mean, those two, three hits were usually massive ones. I mean, it was 50% combos minimum, but you're going to need more than that. And when it wasn't a combo, you're right. It was a stray hit. It was fishing for back airs in neutral, and it felt like norm. Normally, Chimmy's movement is a little cleaner with how they just maneuver around ledge. Like, you saw on that first stock how they, like, B reverse the block land and then slid off to get the back air. Like, some really nice stuff to be tricky about how you're approaching. But then it felt like they were playing Smash Brothers instead of Steve towards the end. I mean, trying to space back airs, take space with short hops. I mean, that's not how Steve plays. <laughs> that's not how Chimmy plays either way. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And it's it's one thing to, you know, be able to change your play style, but it's also another thing to you uh, implement it at the right time here. And it feels like, you know, like you said, when these two players are playing to the strengths of their character, like you saw, it plays to North's favor because he's able to space around it, get the chip damage he needs. And we fit has a surprising amount of kill power in his kit as well. Oh yeah, especially with deep breathing online. Every move is threatening, and that's why Chimmy has to give so much space so much space to We Fit Trainer. I mean, you're on the ground, you could get sent into a bury, you could get caught by the back air, you could be caught by a fully charged salute the sun. And I feel like all of those are feasible options because it didn't feel like Chimmy was ready to react 
to a lot of them. I feel like we're going to see that cleaned up in game two quite a bit. But there were times where it was... You can't even claim unreactable online, blah, 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 blah. It, it was across the stage the soccer ball comes and Chimmy would still get hit. And that cart that Steve has in his kit, I feel like is one of the better answers Steve has to all these projectiles. And so the use of that in here in game number two is something I'm looking forward to see. And now we are seeing a bit more of the block movement. Jimmy, definitely fishing a little bit more and approaching with the shield a lot. Gonna be caught by that salute the sun. So that's a decent chunk of damage and the shield grab is gonna even things up. Vidic healing is actually going to give North the lead, actually. But they were going to have the lead anyway if Chimmy falls right into that nair. Build up the wall and give himself some resources once again. And that's something we only really saw once in game number one. And while Chimmy is down, ooh, great mm. snipe by the soccer ball there of North. And again, it feels like the soccer ball has just done so much work. Yeah, that... The sniper, I mean, there's no other word for it. Able to time that perfectly to get the hit. And now, Jimmy playing at the deficit. They able to get the falling off air, but again, good DI out to avoid being punished too hard. North really is just completely controlling the pace of the team right now, so I, I really don't know. Oh, the rebound right there off of your own blocks. Yeah, it's like you said, North is really in control of the pace of this matchup. And for, for Chimmy right now, he's not used to playing from a deficit. And while that aggressive Steve is something we like to see in the past, it feels like North is ready for it. So back air to shield, gonna catch ya. William and Mary team well prepared for this matchup. Ooh. Lava block on shield, not gonna be enough. And now the up tilt catching the neutral air dodge. That's what I was talking about earlier, how you can call out people trying to escape your combos like that. Shimmy. Looking to go off stage, but they cover the middle distance. North goes high. And oh! The three stock on Chimmy. Oh, wow. That up smash is going to be the finish right there, but it felt like a foregone conclusion, Soy. And you might think Chimmy would be able to take a stock here, but no. North flexing his muscles on that Wii Fit trainer, able to get the three stock. That is a huge victory for William and Mary. That is a bunch of points on the board. And it's one of the, it's very rare that we see three stocks here in the EGF, especially when you've got two teams with winning records on the table. So for North, that is a massive, massive showing. Yeah, five points right there between the three stock. And it was a one stock game one, I think, or maybe a two stock. Either way, 12 to four. That's a pretty massive lead. I mean, one perfect game would tie things up but are you gonna get that that's the question as maris i mean knowing that they're not quite in the oh you have to play for perfection right now but they're still going to need minimum two wins but if they don't get one win then they have to build a massive lead with their first win yeah no absolutely it's it's starting to look scary if you're a Red Fox fan right now, but it's like we've said, these two teams have a lot of depth in their roster. So it feels like, you know, like you said, they're willing to test how deep that roster is for both of these sides, putting in kind of the younger players here first. Now I think we're going to see more of the veterans of these rosters coming up. Yeah, I mean, there's still some heavy hitters. We've got people like Outer Rim, who's famous throughout the entirety of EGF. And, of course, we have plenty of players on uh, Maris. I mean, Maris' roster is gigantic. Obviously, you've got Zucchini, you've got Chimmy, you've got a bunch of new players, too, but the returning players like Rograt on the Greninja. Um, Abso is still a sub on this roster, I think, but it is mostly composed of newer players. I'm wondering how they're going to cope with that. 
Yeah, and it's also interesting, too, that a lot of these newer players for Marist are kind of seeing the spotlight more and more, especially through the first four weeks, and they're still finding a lot of success. It not only speaks to the depth of their roster, but it shows, you know, how talented the that these uh, younger players are. Sometimes players come in and they're, you know, relatively new to the game or they've played, you know, a different game that's similar, something along those lines. But this shows that everyone on Marist even the younger players have some experience. Yes. Marist, now you've got some options. We do know that BFD is coming in, and it's going to be Relax from Marist. Let's see, let's see. Relax, I do recall. They were another Greninja player, uh, probably learning from Rograt. But they are, I do know, a new recruit. Uh... So I'm kind of curious on as to how that's going to go. I mean, Greninja, hard to be a consistent character online, but definitely has the tools and more specifically the kill setups. But they're going to be going up against BFD, the Steve of William and Mary, who I do have to assume gave uh, a lot of practice over to North for that matchup. I mean... I haven't seen BFD Steve all too much yet, but I can't imagine it's bad. I mean, it's on William and Mary's starting roster. <laughs> well, interestingly enough, too, uh, BFD, I believe, was in the league last year, and he mained Piranha Plant, if I uh, remember correctly. So he's got kind of those two options for who he wants to go for. And I'm curious, knowing that he's probably going up against a Greninja and a Greninja that likes to go for those combos, which character he opts for. Yeah, I'm I'm assuming you stick to the Steve. I feel like, let me think, yeah, I feel like Steve definitely has a couple more powerful op burst options to deal with the Greninja. I mean, Greninja dashing in, getting a grab, and then armoring through your Patui, I mean, then you're done. I mean, <laughs> obviously, <Yeah. laughs> Greninja, Piranha Plant has other mix-ups other than that, but... Steve just has more options. I mean, more options than most characters in the entire game. So I'm interested to see how they're going to be playing out on that. It looks like PS2 is going to be the pick, so going pure neutral as far as I can see. Yeah, and these are two, you know, players that I think that these rosters put a lot of emphasis on. BFD last year was one of the key players of this roster. He went 11 and 3 last year and relaxed this season. He's 3-0 so far, so we'll have to see how these players play here as we get ready for set number four. Three, two, yeah, starting one, out, I would go. think Greninja's speed would give you an in on Steve. Make sure you can starve them of resources a bit, but BFD, that's a fast faller, they see. And while not the fastest of fallers, they are still going to be able to get some nice combos carrying you up. And finishing off with the up smash, trying to read a very aggressive option from Relax, but <coughs> they go for the disengage. And that combo gives him a huge lead too, puts the pressure on Relax here to find a way to make a play. And those blocks are just going to be really a pain for Relax to deal with. Yeah, go for the landing there, trying to get a combo starter, but they can't quite put anything together yet, so it. Ooh, good drag down on the up air. Wants a second one, but can't find it. Get the drag now back there, but their eagerness to punish it is going to lead to a down smash. Another down smash off of that anvil right there. Not going to be enough to kill, but still some nice mix ups. Ooh, spacing around the, the roll from ledge is relaxed and. Relax, able to strike first here. Yeah, honestly, some very nice stuff coming out. Relax, using that pressure to make sure you can't get any fancy out of shield options, but you're a fast faller. They saw that Relax was trying to get out throughout the forward smash, but doesn't quite connect. Ooh. Good up smash, knowing that Relax wants to go in around that wall, Ooh. just covers high, and these up smashes have done so much work for Relax, or sorry, for BFD. Yeah, and converting it off of the up air too, every time they hit it, it's a massive counter hit. 
Relax really can't get anything going. Yeah, really struggling to do so. And we've seen Relax really thrive off of those drag downs off up there. We saw off the back air earlier, but just can't seem to quite find those combos. Even getting out of the down tilt, but there's that down tilt into up smash. Counter smart play from Relax to take that stock. Relax actually have the lead right now against a veteran of the scene. This could be huge for them and huge for Maris, who needs this win if they really want to stay. I mean, if they lose here, it's game over, so. It really is. The point spread would be too much, so all the pressure here on Relax as the stocks are even percent in Relax's favor. But BFD has done a great job of controlling the pace of this matchup so far. Landing on that platform, not going to be punished. Some tricky movement as the diamond tools carry them across. That time they're able to get a follow up off of those jabs. The grab. Try and bait them in. But the block in the minecart gives you some mileage. Not going to be caught by the diamond F smash though. Relax is pulling a lot of early air dodges. He is so scared of being hit by this diamond sword. Is, yeah. Fishing for the up tilt, fishing for anything they can. If he's uh, not finding it for now. Nice ledge or platform pressure right there. Ooh! Rolling behind into the F Smash range. That was terrifying. But the Nair into the up smash, not gonna kill quite yet, even with the sweet spot. Gonna hit the shuriken either, but off the ledge, the down smash will do it. Relax, gets a point on the board for Maris and a point in this set. Huge game one there for Relax to take, and I really like that down smash. We really hadn't seen Relax throw out that move all that often, even in previous sets. And right there, kind of realizing BFD's probably not gonna jump from ledge here. Just let me cover the ground, make sure I, I get a strong hit on him somewhere, and he's able to take the stock by doing so. Yeah, I I really do like that because they hadn't gone for that option at all. And when you're not ready for the instant smash attack at ledge, I mean, down, that, down smash is a fast option. It's not the fastest out of everything, but it definitely got the job done as we saw. And I like that because, well, when you're constantly pressuring with the shurikens you give a consistent rhythm a consistent timing that they can get off ledge and be pretty safe and then you disrupt that rhythm then everything's turned on its head yeah no absolutely and so good stuff to relax there in game one and i'm curious too because one of the strengths of uh bfd was kind of his defensive play last season so to see him kind of lose a lead that he had and not be able to find a way back is kind of shocking and it goes to show how how strong relax's greninja was that set yeah relax definitely consistent i feel like they didn't have all of the truest punishes but they knew how to fish for kills and that's the important thing i mean besides the ledge conditioning with the shurikens with the long range attacks they knew when to throw out the counter they knew when to go for Nair up smash, for example, like things like that, that are very, it's hard to have that awareness of like, be almost like a boss battle where like at this percent, I will do this. And at the highest level, that's not great because then you're very predictable. But if you're not able to do that, if you're not able to do the optimal thing in every situation, then it can be, well, a little saddening when people just keep falling out of your combos, out of your kill confirms again and again and again when you are this close. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, the other thing I think that's worth noting here as we get ready for game number two is that, especially towards that last stock, Relax felt like he was playing, I don't want to say scared, but there were a lot of kind of early air dodges and you know, you could tell the second diamond uh, equipment was on the table for BFD the playstyle became a little bit more sporadic, especially in terms of defensive options. So look for that into game number two here, because I think BDF was starting to catch on. Yeah, I think so too. I think so too. BFD, I mean, that's what happens. You adapt, you adapt back. And it was a little slow, the pendulum swinging. Not quite fast enough in that set, but BFD, they might be able to turn it around here, like you said. I feel like it does rely a lot around of preemptively stopping the burst options because Greninja is definitely, I feel like 
not as much of a rushdown in completely choking you out and more of a burst character. Like they will they hit and run, that's the word I'm looking for. They come in, they steal away a bunch of percent, they put you in disadvantage, and then they're out of there. They're far out of dodge. And there's not a ton you can do to really contest it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And also, I, I also kind of want to note that second stock being taken by the counter was a huge momentum swing for Relax because you got to remember Relax at that point was at 160%. He was basically working on borrowed time. So for him to be able to take that stock and kind of swing the momentum in his favor was massive. And so you have to wonder, you know, going into game number two, does he have another play like that in his you know bag of tricks? Only time will tell. Is Maris really, really desperate for this win if they want to stay in this? I mean, obviously you want to stay within the range where you don't have to play a perfect game. But realistically, a win here for BFD with any amount of points would put you out of the perfect win range. So relax, a lot of pressure on their shoulders. Can't quite be tension free like that eating a lot of early percent here. This could be a big edge guard. The spike, he's gonna land it. BFD with a big lead. And now BFD playing the lead. Sky basing just a little bit. Don't disrespect the SD, relax. I was watching them eagerly, but hey, SD in to punish. True combo. 42%, they're not terrible against Eve. His down tilt in the dash attack. He's gonna leave him some more. 25% they catch the landing with the Nair as well. Not enough to keep it going, but there's some nice damage. Landing of the 40. That's some safe meaty hitbox to drag down on platform. Isn't quite gonna punish though. And the extra hit lag because of hitting the crafting table is actually what let BFD punish that. Things just about back to even here, but that's a good follow up with the forward air. Interesting kind of setup there from Relax, but not going to be able to land either of those specials, and that's going to allow for an opening here for BFD, but he can't get the follow-up either. Field pressure on, on lock right there. Does it go? Oh my gosh, that was every option covered. They covered the roll. The only thing they didn't really technically have covered was the jump, but I think they're just banking on their ability to react with it from down to on the platform. No chance to tech whatsoever. That's an up smash, baby. Relax, hold on to the lead until he gets smacked by the minecart. Things back to dead even here on the last stock, but this is going to be a lot of damage. When does he pull the trigger on that up smash? Great oh. parry by Relax. The parry at the end there? Okay, Relax, nice to you. Through the reverse card, but... BFD, going to take a lot more to slay this piece as they're able to get the up tilt up there. Back air, send Relax into disadvantage. We're recovering all the way to the other side of the stage. They did not want to play around there. And now both players have to play very carefully as Relax, he is at kill percent and BFD. Not quite there yet, but one strong hit of something like up smash or forward smash, especially in the right spot, could do it. An opening, but no dice on the follow up for these down tilts. They're right there. They can sense them. But that's a dash neck instead at this percent. That's not going to combo. Up smash right there. Not going to connect either. You can see some nice flips He's being played by Relax trying to bait something in. But then they go for the forward smash. You know the full up full forward air though to finish it off. BFG caught slipping just a little bit and well. Relax ain't gonna let you get away with that one as they're able to keep Maris in this series with a good performance in this last game. I mean, anything but the minimum amount of points, Maris has a very real possibility to take this home. And I think right there, the footsies was the difference. Vital to Relax's gameplay. As you saw, I think you could tell Relax got a little eager for that kill numerous times throwing out that up smash knowing BFD was above him. But at the end of the day there, finally landing that combo into the forward air was the, the move that got the job done. And we hadn't really seen a ton of that. The forward air, you know, obviously a great combo move, but not something that really Relax was able to land a ton this set. Yeah, I mean, it's a good finisher 
for certain, for certain. But it is hard to combo into it. It's a very specific percent window. And that's because of how much startup it has. It doesn't have that much lag. It's really safe to land with, to space with. But the startup, I mean, it's a whole... I mean, you can watch a whole movie in the time it takes to get that thing booted up. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. But uh, great stuff to relax to take that set over BFD. And like we said, they've given Maris a chance here. Yeah, but the thing that worries me... Yeah, that's what I thought. Outer Rim. Gonna be coming in here. And I, I feel like they are one of the scariest players on the entirety of William and Mary. And they're going up against Luke. Let me double check. Wasn't that Luke on the Sephiroth before? Hold on a minute. <laughs> yeah, uh, Luke kind of, he switched between characters before. I, I have him down as Sephiroth and, and Cloud uh, as his two characters that he's opted for in the past. But Outer Rim has been on this Robin since day one, I, I feel like. And he was one of the players that, you know, like you said, has been kind of the scariest player on the on the roster, especially this year, 3-0. and And even last season, he was 13-2. and His only losses were to Baco from Quinnipiac and JJ from George Washington. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I stand corrected. Apparently, Luco and Luke... Are two different people. I would have guessed <laughs> it. Um, yeah, as uh, yeah, I got tripped up a little bit, but yeah, it's gonna be Outer Rim versus Luke, who also, I believe, plays Sephiroth, and that is gonna be interesting. Another uh, less popular sortie matchup. Yeah, and something like Sephiroth v uh, uh, Robin could be very interesting because you have you know as Sephiroth you have the range you know with your sword but one thing Outer Rim does really well is space his projectiles and something like that that side B uh, I don't know the name of the move but that side B could do a lot of work because it's at an, a kind of an awkward angle Sephiroth's angles wouldn't be able to necessarily contest that yeah very straightforward hitboxes they do go straight forward, though. That is the thing. So if you're not spacing correctly, if you're not giving them all of the space that they need to flail around, then you're going to get caught. And Sephiroth does have the speed to close the distance, especially with one wing coming online. A lot more mix-up as well to get out of combos, because you don't have to worry about burning your one jump. You got two. But... I mean, out of rim... Specifically, their use of the thunder, not just the fully charged laser beam or even the shield shredding blast. I mean, just the regular thunder as a quick poking projectile. It's more than most players are able to handle. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's going to do a ton of work here against a light character like Sephiroth. I feel like this battle is kind of, kind of going to be uh, one with Sage Control, right? Because you not only have the poke from both characters, but the minute one of these characters ends up off stage, it could just mean death for them. Yeah, as we have seen some varying theories on how to edge guard with Sephiroth. I mean, he's got great ledge trapping due to the fact that it's hard to really punish him. But, I mean... There, there is definitely some wiggle room in how you actually go about getting that ledge trapping, especially online. Neutral get up very hard to punish, but we've seen some people really, I mean, call out neutral get up into shield. Even today, with that run up down smash earlier, that's some good stuff right there. I mean, that's the kind of hard call outs that you need to take down a team like Marist College. Willem and Mary, they're on the precipice. They have victory well within their sights, well within their rights. All they have to do is take it to last hit, last stock both times, and they get to go to an overtime match. If they're able to do that, though, well, we will have to see. So like we said, Outer Rim on the Robin, and it's going to be Luke for Maris on the Sephiroth. They're starting off on PS2. 
And there's the thunder right away, completely controlling the ground game. As the full hop shadow flares, full hop aerials are what looks to be Luke's choice until they get caught by the thunder. The arc fire not going to lead into a grab, but you get caught by the Levin sword. That's some nice chunky damage. And this is the game for Luke. Can he find a way to get in space around some of these projectiles? Says now that he's in. Quick 33 on the outer and wanted the edge guard but couldn't find it. Can't find the up smash either. And the shadow flare as well, but I think they don't care that much about that damage. Perfect spacing to avoid any shield pressure or shield break potential. Get the spike right there. Back air not going to connect, but one wing's not going to do you many favors. That super armor doesn't come into play until you're on the ground. Ooh, interesting down smash there. Is able to land it, but now. Luke off stage is able to get back, but Outer him. Oh, snipes him with the book. That's actually going to take the stock. That's a huge stock for Adam to take. I've never seen one of the items kill so. I've never seen someone literally get smacked by the knowledge, but off of that drain as well. Outer Rim getting the percent back. Oh man, this is looking bad for Luke. I mean, you need a dominant performance here. Not dominant, but you need a strong performance at the very least in order to keep Maris from being out of this. Right now, Robin's saying, my projectiles might not be as strong as yours, but they are a whole lot more useful. Just completely blocking out these players. Luke is kind of hunting for a way to get this kill. He is able to find the strong hit of back air and it will kill off the top, so stocks back to even. But now every spell and item is back online for Robin and that's so much power for Outer Rim. Yeah. Able to land the Shadow Flare. Going to be forcing Outer Rim to play around their shield a little more, but being caught in the jump is going to put them in disadvantage for a moment, but they still managed to land a nice thunder. Rim gets more saved though, gonna miss time the down air, and that's gonna get you punished pretty hard. The ledge trapping from Outer Rim, something he thrives off of. Luke is able to get around it for now, but he's at 150. Moving right over that arc fire, but gonna be caught by the L Thunder. Outer Rim trying to just run off that platform, steal away the stock, but getting greedy like that could get you punished towards the end as you've got one Shadow Flare on you. But, plenty of opportunity to block that while you're putting it in the blast zone. So Luke now on his last stock. Needs a little bit of percent here. And every percent Outer Rim gets Ooh. here is massive for the stock. Luke being comboed from across the stage. Outer Rim gets some nice percent right there. And even though you've got one wing, you've got to use it to maximum efficiency. As... Well, you need to play perfectly to avoid any of these kill setups. I mean, one arc fire right now at that diagonal angle, I, I feel like that would be a setup into 11 sword, but the super armor right there towards the end actually does help him finish that off. That armor was massive, does find a way to take the stock, and now things back to even. Luke's got a chance here, but outer him again so much pressure on the board for him with all these projectiles everything back online at the start of the stock that should do it the yeah. up smash follow-up yeah arc fire off of the ledge going to collide straight into robin finishing them off and well not much coming back from that but luke did keep it close towards the end right there you're gonna need better than close though because coming back again, you need still an even more dominant performance coming back. And when you've only gotten the one win, well, William and Mary, they can smell the blood in the water, soy. Yeah, no, absolutely. If they find a way to win this set, they close it all out. And even if they don't, just minimalizing the damage that Luke can do will be enough in theory. So we'll have to see. But I really got to commend... Uh, you know, Luke's efforts at the end, it felt like he was starting to get a read on, you know, the, the matchups and how he was going to be able to find those kills. The problem was it felt like he was, you know, trading essentially, just trading positioning for damage or trading, even on that last stock, the down smash, for, uh, trading all that percent with the side B, he's able to take the stock, 
but he puts himself at such a deficit on his own that it feels like once Outerim has a lead, it's just so difficult to find a comeback onto him. And on paper, it feels ludicrous that Luke has to trade with a lot of these options because you're Sephiroth. Who's going to trade with you? Min Min? No. You're Sephiroth. But it's not really... I mean, like you said, they're not, they're not necessarily trading hits. They're trading eating a projectile for space. Eating a projectile for control. Being caught in a combo while trying to get control. And a lot of the time, these trades aren't even getting damage onto... Uh onto uh outer rim i mean towards the end it, it really felt like it was just outer rim running the pace and even though they did get caught by that down smash it was still really hard to manage Three, two, one, go. absolutely and i think the key here get it headed into game number two is luke at high percents you know he hasn't found an edge guard yet onto robin but the fact that Outerim was getting so much extra mileage, he was able to seal those stocks away. Luke at high percents has to play a lot more careful. And speaking of percents, Outerim is determined to make sure that they don't have any. Continuously leaping forward with this drain. Get some nice percentage. I, I mean, they're just getting rid of their own deficit. Throw the arc fire onto the side of the stage. Starting to catch on on how much Luke loves these shadow flares. I mean, every day of the week they're throwing out that snap, and it's safe, sure, but it's not completely safe. So, what? no, absolutely, it's good for the spacing of Luke. It's a good projectile to kind of contest. But oh my goodness, the back air, the strong hitbox with that Levin sword sealing away the first stock, and now Luke's got so much work to do as Outer him only at 53. They're off stage with the Shadow Flare, but they connect with the ledge at just the right time. And now, with that strong hit, even a forward air from Eleven Sword is going to put you at ledge. But Stephros forward air can be just as strong at times. Searching for that sweet spot, but they don't need to find it if they land with the counter. And that's a couple of times now that Luke has tried to land the kill with that down air on the ledge. And it is possible, but the spacing has just been too clean by Outer Rim. Throwing the book at you right there is Outer Rim. Really teaching Luke a lesson about overcommitting, but Luke has a lesson to you about ledge trapping. Catching the jump away eventually. With the up smash, Luke. Stock off the board. I mean, they'd still need a miracle to claim this set, but at this point, you know anything is possible. But being caught by that arc fire, the air dodge out covered. I don't know if that's the most optimal thing you can do. As you get drained as well, that's going to give them one wing, but is that really much of a condolence when you've already lost all your life? Trying to shore hop away, but the flames will follow you. Now Luke is staring on the barrel of a two stock right now. Has an opening, can't quite find that forward air. And every percent that Outer Rim gets here could be massive. Great stall out around that, that Solar Flare. That is... Interesting, interesting. They use the Super Armor right there to get through the multi-hit. Alright. Definitely possible for Luke to clutch this out. I mean, they'd need a 3-stock next game if they want to take the game, but... So you want to keep it close if you can. Shadow Flares, you've got them above you. Luke not over committing. Reminiscent of another Sephiroth of a similar name. As they snap right to ledge right there. Again, not over committing, not trying to get some fancy option right there. But the drain kind of undoes a lot of that neutral win. And the jump is called out. Luke looking for options, searching for the way in. And paths were literally repaved with walls in front of them i, I mean <laughs> work undone before your eyes and outer rim able to finish them off right there giving william mary double the points of what maris college had and putting them way up there on the rankings now after that win 
Yeah, that's a huge win. Knocking down an undefeated team is certainly a momentum boost for William & Mary, but I really got to commend Outer Rim once again. His play, it's just so clean at times. And even though Outer Rim didn't land a lot of the staple stuff that we've seen him do, things like the, the side B ledge trapping, he was still able to just control the pace of the matchup. And even though, it's like he said, Luke had his opportunities, and he had, but he had to trade things for them. He just made it so difficult for Luke to really find a way back into that match. And you did call out he was finding answers. He was finding the down tilt through the flames. He was finding, or down smash rather, he was finding options, but in the end it wasn't enough. In the end it didn't really give you the lead you needed. Just bought more time off the clock and even if you're bringing it to last hit, last stock, if you can't close it out, if you don't have enough of a lead to really scrap, then it's going to be game over, as we can see, with once again, William Mary getting a very impressive lead. Absolutely. We're going to be trying... We're going to be trying no, now to... Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> my apologies. My apologies. But I, I also wanted to commend Outer M2, the one other note for that set. His resource management was fantastic. Like you said, I've never seen the book kill. I've never seen someone burn a book, throw it, and still have it land for it for a kill. On Sephiroth, too, a character that you feel like might be a little bit more difficult to edge guard. He sniped him out of the air on that first stock. And even things like the second Levin Sword is offstage. Just Outer Rim's resource management was really commendable, that set. Yeah, very impressive. And... We're not going to ask them, but we can get a little more insight as to uh, how Willie and Mary was able to put together that upset. Though it was a close upset, still an upset nonetheless, with an interview with Luco coming up soon. So don't go anywhere. EGFC will be back in just a few minutes. Welcome back, everybody, to EGFC. We are back here with Luco, the Sephiroth player from William and Mary. How you doing, Luco? 
I'm doing awesome. Thank you for asking. How are you guys? Hey, we're doing fantastic, and I can see why you're doing awesome after that win, and especially your personal win over Coldface. It looked really practiced as you beat out both of the secondaries right there. Or not secondaries. I mean, Coldface has so many different characters. Did you were you aware of who you may be facing going into this match? Yeah, we had planned for a bunch of Maris players and Coldface was in the was in the discussion, so we knew that they played Lucina. And when I heard that they were sending out Coldface next, I thought, you know, I offered myself to the team, like I could play next if, if need be, and that's what I did. And may I ask, like, what was the mentality behind that sacrificial offer right there? Like, uh, I mean, it was just we wanted to save our good players for when we needed them. Not that I'm not like I'm like not a good <laughs> player, or they needed to use me like get me out of the way real quick but um i yeah i just offered to go i i could have played i didn't feel too bad about playing against lucina and later when he switched to captain falcon that was another matchup that i was okay with all right yeah very nice and that showed in your score line <laughs> yeah no yeah. absolutely um oh. This for you was your first official EGF set victory. You played a lot of close sets. How does it feel to kind of get you, get the first one under your belt? It feels, a part of me feels like I should have, this should have happened a long time ago, obviously, but you know, a win is a win and it's all for the team. I'm just very, well, I'm personally satisfied that I won, of course, but overall that it helped out the team in order to secure their victory. I'm very happy that I was able to come through when they needed it yeah, yeah. i mean definitely helping yeah. set up the point differential right there and you said uh you were sitting there watching the stream hold on i do gotta ask real quick is that a big old sephiroth right behind you <laughs> uh, no, i don't know what you're talking about this is the <laughs> world's dream it's Listen, a, yeah it's, it's just the flight oh there he goes well, but... <laughs> all right all right well yeah, don't worry about it. He's, he's not he's not uh, cooperating today. Yeah, Square Enix is not gonna get on our backs for that being on stream. <laughs> but uh either way, yeah. You really did have I mean, I I wouldn't say you have full mastery of the character yet, but you were very consistent wow. with how you got the punishes. Um <laughs> So like how do you like practice for these matches? Like like how do you get going before a match? Um, before a match specifically, I would like to warm up in an online environment. So I just pull up an arena and I ask some of my teammates to come play with me. Besides that, my practice routine just sort of boils down to, does anybody want to play? And usually <laughs> I go over to, uh, you know, I visit some of my friends and we have times for the team to practice. So we get a lot of, we get a lot of offline practice, which is very, very nice. And uh, yeah, I'm still yeah, I'm still working on the Sephiroth. He's definitely a demanding character in that aspect. But you know, I feel I figure if he were to talk to me right now, he wouldn't want anything more than my best. That's no, kidding. He would never say that. But that's how <laughs> yeah. I feel about I myself. Mean, he, he, if, he, yeah. fell down. he fell down. He did try and give you yeah. a warm embrace. So that's like... true. That's true. <laughs> But yeah, we do we do practice against each other a lot, both well, primarily offline because we have the we're very grateful for the opportunity to do so. And when we need to, you know, switch to EGF mode, we do practice online as well. Yeah. Well, that's really good to hear, and I'm glad you're uh, playing to the format, playing for the win you're trying to get. <laughs> yeah, of course. All right, so my my last question here for you. You guys have, uh, you you know, through the first four weeks, now heading into kind of the second half of this first split, you guys have a bit of a Mac gauntlet going on. You got Maris this week. You, next week, you get Iona. The week after, you get Canisius. And then you end this split against the defending champs of Mississippi State. So how do you prepare for these, you know, weekly matchups, especially knowing that you're going up against kind of the same type of conference uh, every, every week, you know, for the next couple of weeks, I should say. When we take preparing for certain teams into account, what we do is, well, we look at their roster and we look at the potential players and respective characters that could be 
a matchup against us. So we make sure to organize beforehand, like if they have a certain player with a certain character that one of our guys doesn't like, then obviously we're going to save our guy for later, not play against that guy. Um, in terms of, I mean, that's sort of the, yeah, that's a strategy that we just apply to every single team we're about to face in the coming, uh, yeah, in the coming weeks in the matches. Specifically, we don't really, like, against certain teams, obviously some, some teams' records are much better than others, but we kind of don't take that into account, you know, it's like anything can happen. So we just work to play to make sure that, you know, we're doing it for us and we play our best. And if our best just happens to topple like a really good team or like even, you know, a not so good team, although there aren't any bad teams in the in the league that we, yeah, our our strategy just pertains to, you know, practicing because we got to stay fresh, got to stay warm. But yeah, there isn't much exclusivity when it comes to preparing for certain teams in certain schools. We just, yeah, make the dream work, try our best. Okay. And the dream has been working. I mean, you got that win, so congrats on that one more time. And thank you so much for uh, coming out here for this interview, Luca. Of course. Thank you guys for having me. Have the rest of your evenings. Yeah. We will, we will, because we got more EGFC action coming up very soon. We got another match in just a couple minutes. I think uh, 610, roughly, we're getting into it. So grab a drink, grab some popcorn, and get back here. There's going to be more Collegiate Smash coming up in a little bit.